This morning I want to talk uh, from the book of Acts chapter 8. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn there, Acts chapter 8. Um, all the verses will be on the screen as well. But I want to talk about direction. And um, so let me ask you a question as I do. How many of you uh, like to ask for direction or directions? You raise your hand. There's actually quite a few of you. How many of you refuse to ask for directions? There you go. We know who you are. We've seen you circling the block multiple times looking for the right location. Uh, so uh, if you have to assemble something, do you like to read the instructions and the directions or you just want to wing it? So I'm a direction reader and one of the reasons is because I know that if I go all the way to the back, I can see the finished product. And so I like following the directions so I can get there and, and know that I'm going to arrive at the right location. Uh, most of us, if not all of us at one time or another, have asked God for direction, right? You've had a decision to make and you've prayed, God, what do I need to do? Which, which choice do I need to make? Um, in the book of Acts chapter 8, we see God giving direction um, through an angel. We see him giving direction by his Holy Spirit to the apostle Philip. And so just a quick background of what we're going to read. Jesus has risen from the dead. And then over a period of 40 days, he appears to the disciples. Um, the apostle Paul later tells us that he appeared to over 500 believers at one time before he ascends into the heavens. And before his ascension into the heavens, he told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the day the Holy Spirit came, we know as Pentecost. Peter gets up and preaches, thousands are saved. And then the believers, the, all those who had come to faith in Christ, that this, these hundreds that now became thousands overnight, began to stir things up. And not, not necessarily intentionally. They didn't go out looking to, to pick fights and to, to cause trouble. But in the way that they lived, their actions, it stirred things up. They, they just began to, to, to spread and to share the good news of Jesus. They took the gospel with them everywhere they went, wherever they went. And so those who traveled for business, they, they took the gospel with them to the places where they traveled. It had, it had changed the way they approached everything that they did. And as they did all of this, they, they stuck together. They were unified. And if a need arose, someone just met the need. People would sell their property and they'd bring the, the money and say, hey, who, who has a need? And they would, they would meet a need. And so there were, in this early church, there were no needs because as soon as a need came up, somebody met it. What an amazing thing. And so they did all of this and their numbers grew daily. And for me, that's just amazing that their numbers grew daily. But we have to remember that the religious establishment that, that executed Jesus, they didn't just disappear after Jesus ascended to the heavens. They didn't. Um, they actually just turned their attention to his followers and as they stirred up trouble, they came after them and they were arrested and beaten and imprisoned. And then in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is executed, the first martyr for his faith in Christ. And we're going to pick up just after that in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. and Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, if, you, uh, if you've never read through the book of Acts and you've never read specifically like chapter 6 and 7, Stephen's story, it's pretty fantastic. 
because Stephen was the same kind of thing. He was sharing his faith. He was making a difference in people's lives. And because of that, the, the religious people, they, they didn't like it. And so um, they, they, they arrest him and they bring him on trial. And in many ways, his trial is very similar to the trial that Jesus experienced. It's very similar. Sanhedrin, it's the same kind of, brought into the same place. And, but when they ask him to answer the accusations, and there were lots of false accusations, the same kind of false accusations they brought against Jesus, they brought against Stephen. But when Stephen shares, he, he shares the gospel with him, but he doesn't just go straight to Jesus. He goes all the way back. And that's one of the things I love about it. And Paul really does the same thing. When you see Paul share a lot of times, Paul tells, he doesn't just talk about Jesus. He goes all the way back and connects all the dots all the way to Jesus. And that's what Stephen does. Stephen starts with Abraham and says, you you guys know that God came to Abraham and told him to go to the place I will show you. He walks all the way through. Abraham goes to Moses, goes all the way through. And he gets all the way to the end of the story. And then he says, and Jesus came and you guys killed him. And that's when it ticked him off. It, It actually, he goes all the way through and he gets to the point where he says, and then Jesus came, the Messiah came and you killed him. And it says they became enraged and they drag him out and they start stoning him. And as they're stoning him, they're taking off their coats because this is serious business. They're taking off their coats and they lay him at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we would later know as the Apostle Paul. And he stood there. And that's why when we read in verse one, Saul agreed with them putting him to death. Saul is there and he didn't throw any stones, but he cheered it on. He said, I'll hold your coats while you kill him. And then after that, he was emboldened to say, let's go find all the other people like Stephen and let's, let's round them up and let's imprison them let's, until they recant and turn from this. So that's what's going on. This, this, after that, the, the persecution gets incredibly bad. Saul is going and he's, he's going house to house, it says, and looking for people who follow Jesus. And so they're scattered. And wouldn't you do that? If you knew they were coming for you, you would scatter. And that's what they did. They scattered. But it says as they went, they, they preached the gospel everywhere they went. They didn't go into hiding. They didn't, they didn't pretend that they weren't followers of Christ. They scattered. But as they scattered, they shared. And that's exactly what we see in these first eight verses. And it speci- specifically speaks of Philip. And it says that he went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. And many believed. There was great joy in the city. This is what Philip was doing. So I want us to skip ahead a little bit in Acts chapter 8 to verse 26. And a little bit more about Philip. It says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. Very powerful man. He'd come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this, and it's a quote. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about? Is it about himself or someone else? And Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So the rest of our time today, I want us to talk about and consider direction from God. And not just direction, but directions often. And how we are to follow them. Jesus has ascended into the heavens. 
He has sent his spirit to live within us, to convict us and teach us and guide us into all truth and to lead us. And if you are a genuine, real deal disciple of Jesus, then you're a person who has decided to follow Jesus and learn from Jesus and to allow him to make you like him. And if that's you, then, then by his spirit, Jesus is going to lead you. He's going to give you direction and directions. And if you are a true disciple, you will want to and you will follow him. When you receive that direction, when you get those directions, you will obey. You will follow. You, you won't try to go your own way. You won't try to make up your own path. You won't blaze your own trail. You'll follow his direction. The tricky part for us is that when and how and where Jesus leads us by his spirit doesn't often look the way we think it will. It rarely looks the way we prefer. Let me show you. Verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and here's what he said. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He says, this is the desert road. Get up and go south. I don't know about you, but that, that's not a lot of information. I mean, he gave me the road and the direction to go on the road. But I like a little more direction than that. I just told you guys, I, I'm a, I like to read the, the, the instructions, right? Because I know that there's going to be step one, step two, step three, step 3A, three 3B, three 3C. Three I'm going to miss 3C for what it's worth. And on seven, I'm going to realize I got to go back and take it apart, right? He says, go south down to this road. The first thing you need to know is that from our perspective, God's directions are often open-ended. You can understand that as from our perspective, they seem incomplete. He doesn't give us all of the information on the front end. Oftentimes, he doesn't give us even step two or three, just step one. Just, he, honestly, for Philip, he gave him a road and which direction to go on the road. That's quite a bit of information. How many of you would honestly be very happy to know you were on the right road in your life? Because there's times where we don't know. There's times where you honestly, you're, you're, you're walk, waking up each day and you're moving forward and you go, I'm not even sure I'm on the right road. Did I miss a turn back there? There's times when, the, and a lot of times it's because as you're walking through life, things aren't going the way you thought they would. And you start to second guess and question, am I even on the right road? And if I am on the right road, am I going in the right direction on the road? There's two ways. But God's directions are often open-ended. And I don't know about you, but I prefer a little more direction in my directions. I don't just want to know which way to go. I want to know what I'm going to find when I get there. I'd like to know why I'm going there. And if at all possible, what I'm going to do when I get there. That's just me. Maybe you're like that. I want a little bit more direction in my directions. But God simply told Philip which road to be on, which direction to go on that road. And basically he would let him know when he got there what he needed to do. Later in verse 29, um, the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. So there, there was going to be more direction to the directions, but it wasn't going to come on the front end. And the truth is, is that Philip would never get to verse 29, go and join that chariot if he hadn't gone south on that road. For, for most of us, we want more direction in our directions, but that's because unt until we step out in obedience, God does not give us any more. There is nothing in scripture or seen throughout history that would lead us to believe that God ever gives us more information than we need in the moment. If we are unwilling to follow the creator of the universe and the savior of our souls with limited information, we will not obey with all the details. If you think that you would be obedient if you had all the information, you're, you are sadly mistaken. 
If you do not trust God to go with the limited, what you feel is limited information he gives you, you would not obey with all the information. Because here's the thing, when you get all the information, you know what you discover? All the struggles along the way. And for some of you, if you knew some of the struggles, you go, I don't know that I would go down this road. It's been difficult. We have to notice how Philip responds to God's open ended directions. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. In verse 27, it says, so he got up and went. That was the end of the sentence. He didn't pray about it, which is kind of a funny thing that we would need to pray about direction that God gives us. Who, who are we going to ask? Oh, God, do you want me to obey you? Yeah. That's kind of why I told you to go. He didn't, he didn't go and ask for advice. He didn't gather up all the other apostles and go, listen, the angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, that was, whoa, 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 whoa. Angel came? You do what the angel says every time. You don't need to gather up all your buddies. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to meditate on it. He just got up and went. When God gives direction, you need to go. It doesn't matter if the directions seem incomplete. When Philip got the message, he, he got up and went. From our perspective, God's directions often seem open-ended. But if they're going to be open-ended and we're going to be obedient, our obedience must be unhindered. It can't be limited. It, it can't be Delayed. Initially, God gave direction with no detail, and Philip obeyed instantly. And when he obeyed instantly, the angel of the Lord came and said, Go south on the road. It goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, the desert road. So he got up and went. He's just walking down the road. I have no idea why I'm on this road. I don't know what I'm going to find. I, I may just be out for a walk. He obeyed instantly, and then God gave more direction. In verse 27, there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He'd come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. And the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? When Philip got up and went, he had no idea what was next. Only that God had given him direction and directions. And apart from his unhindered obedience, he would have never experienced what was next. If he had waited for more details, if he'd requested more information, he would have missed the Ethiopian on the road. You have to understand that what we often think... I've got my movement, I've got my obedience, I, I want to be on, on. But oftentimes there are other things that are happening and God is aware of them and we are not. He had no idea that this Ethiopian even existed, much less that he was going to be on this road at this time. What a coincidence, except that it wasn't a coincidence. And think about if he had delayed, he would have missed the opportunity. So notice what he didn't do. He didn't, he didn't stop and pray about it. He didn't gather his friends and ask for their advice. He didn't wait for his local church to organize a ministry on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. He just obeyed without delay. He didn't make it complicated. He just obeyed. And you may be thinking, okay, that sounds really simple, but sometimes that's hard to do. Let's keep in mind what he and all of the other disciples had been doing. If you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, here's what they were doing. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is what they were doing. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is what they were doing. Before the persecution broke out, before they were scattered, this is what they were doing. 
if I could sum up what they were doing, they devoted themselves to discipleship, to being disciples of Jesus. And they knew that the way that was going to happen was together. That Jesus didn't call one disciple, he called a group of disciples. He had 12 of them. There was a reason for that. When your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength are devoted to loving God and loving your neighbor, when your heart is saturated in the word of God, when you are consistently gathering with other disciples who are devoted to the same things, the craziest things start to happen. The the direction that you receive from God, the clarity of it, even though it may seem incomplete, it's very clear. Think about that, that Even when the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip, he didn't get all the details, but it was very clear what his direction. He told him exactly what road to go to and exactly which direction to go. Very clear. God is not hiding from us. His will is not hidden from us. It's not that that we can't find it and discover it. He wants to lead us and guide us and direct us, but we miss him because we have hearts that are not devoted to, to loving him and to loving each other because we're not committed to discipleship. I just say it this way. There's a direct connection between being devoted to discipleship and being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And some of you have experienced this in seasons of your life where you have been devoted to being a disciple, to learning from Christ, to following Christ, to doing it with others. You start to hear God better. You are more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Maybe I could say it this way. This might be helpful. When you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you don't miss God-prepared opportunities. And Philip was in tune. So when the direction came, he just obeyed. And because he obeyed, he didn't miss the God-prepared opportunity. Don't, Don't miss the significance of the guy that he got to share with. It painted us a a pretty detailed picture, right? He was a high official in the Ethiopia. Actually, he was over all the treasury. This is a powerful man who now has experienced faith in Christ, been baptized, and is gonna get back in his chariot and go back to Ethiopia and share the gospel with everyone he knows. Why? Why? Because Philip obeyed an open-ended direction. Because he didn't wait. But it's not only that. Notice what Philip was doing before the angel of the Lord gave him this direction. Verse 4. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. You might might think, yeah, just like later on in the chapter. The thing is, is that we don't have any indication that God, by his Holy Spirit or by an angel, told Philip to go to this town in Samaria and to preach the gospel. He just did it. He was actually already sharing the gospel before the Holy Spirit guided him in a specific direction. He was already doing this. He just wasn't doing it in that specific place. He wasn't just sitting on his hands waiting for direction from God before he did anything. He was already doing it. He, was, he went to this town. He proclaimed the Messiah to them and many believed there was great joy. I'll just put it to you this way. God tends to move those who are already moving. How about this? God tends to work with those who are already working. If you are sitting, waiting on direction from God, I'm just going to tell you this. The best thing you can do is get off your butt and get to work. You need to already be moving. It wasn't a, a crazy thing for him to go from where he was down on this road, even though he didn't know what was going to be there when he got there. You know why? He was already moving. He was already going from town to town. He was already preaching and proclaiming the Messiah. He was already doing this. 
And you know what else? So was everyone else. All the other disciples were doing it. Not just the apostles. Actually, if you read it, the only ones who didn't go anywhere were the apostles. They stayed put. Everyone else was scattered. And what did they do as they were scattered? They preached the word. God tends to move those who are already moving and he tends to work with those who are already working. If we want to be moved by the spirit, we got to get moving. If we want God to work in our lives, we got to get to work. We already have plenty to be doing. There is so much in scripture that you've already been told to do that you don't ever need to pray and ask God for direction again. You can stay busy the rest of your life just being obedient to what he's already said. Well, Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. How about this? Start doing that. Get busy moving and working and doing that. And then if God gives you something specific to do in a specific place, then by all means, go and do that. Be obedient instantly. But in the meantime, you've already got plenty to do. Philip was already moving. He was already going and preaching, already working for the kingdom of God. And because of that, he was uniquely positioned to be used by God. Because we already know this, that objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Even God, the creator of the universe, knows it's easier to move somebody who's already moving than somebody who's planted themselves and is doing nothing. Some are busy, some are moving, but they're not busy about kingdom work. If we want to be used by God, we have to be listening to his spirit. If we want to hear his spirit, we must learn his voice and the vocabulary of the Holy Spirit is his word. God wants to lead us by his spirit. So we have to tune in. We have to tune in. God, what do you have for me? Well, I've already given you like thousands of pages. I, I, I've, and not only that, read the New Testament. I've given you the examples of, all, of so many who when they came to faith, this is what they started doing. There's, there is no indication in the book of Acts that when they all gathered together, the first thing the apostles said was, hey, listen, you guys are going to have to share your faith with people. You're going to have to tell people about Jesus. They did. There's no indication that they got together and the apostles said, hey, listen, there's a bunch of needs. You guys are going to have to start giving some stuff so we can meet needs. They just did it. Because the Holy Spirit was moving in them. And because they were moving, God moved them. And because they were working, God worked in them. And I think most of us would say, yeah, as a follower of Christ, I want to be moved by God. I want, to, I, want to, I want to hear his voice. I want to know the direction. I want to know what road to be on. I want to know which direction to be going on that road. And the first thing I can tell you is this, is if you want to be moved by God, get moving. If you want, to be, if you want God to work in your life, get to work. Philip was. And because of that, there was nothing special about Philip other than the fact that because he was already moving, because he was already working, he was a prime candidate for God to use. And that can be true of every single one of us. We absolutely need God. We need his guidance. We need the Holy Spirit to empower our efforts. But the thing is, is that he has already given us so much to be obedient to that as soon as we start step forward in obedience, he's there to meet us with his power and empower us to do these things. So God may have a, a unique and special, specific place for you to go. But I'm going to tell you this, until you hear that word, until you receive that direction, get moving and get to work. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for not just saving us and leaving us in the dark. Because you gave us your word, you have given us so much to be obedient to. And that's a good thing. That's not a restrictive thing. Father, we, we already know what we should be doing with our lives. And even as we work the jobs we have and, and uh, live in the households we, we are in and raise the children that you have blessed us with and 
even as we build relationships with, with people in our community, you have already told us exactly what to do, and that is to make disciples. And so, God, I know that all, all of us would probably agree that we want your direction and directions in our life. And, God, you, you have specific things that you have prepared for each of us to do. But, God, I pray that we will get moving and that we will get to work. And, Father, as we do, your spirit will meet us with your power because we so desperately need it. We can't do any of this on our own. But, Father, you're not going to drag us. You invite us and you call us and you lead us and you guide us. I pray that we'll be dependent upon you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.